you all right? Fooly Cooly, or FLCL, or if you want to get technical, is one of the weirdest shows I've ever seen, and that's not a bad thing. The abstract visuals and the tongue-in-cheek jokes kept my eyes glued to the screen for the first time I watched this, and after a couple of rewatches, I was fully satisfied with what it was trying to say, and contrary to the belief of multiple popular anime YouTubers that also talked about this show, while saying that every shot in the six-episode OVA has a meaning is a bit of a stretch, this show did mean something, which I believe is the reason why this show has garnered a cult following. But to my surprise, with the amount of information I've happened to gather regarding Fooly Cooly, I have decided to structure this video differently. And by that, I mean I actually gave it a structure this time. So I have chosen to split this video up into a few parts, because hey, why the hell not? But before I get into the good stuff, here's a quick sum up of the main storyline to get people who haven't seen Fooly Cooly yet up to speed with everyone else, and I'll add more to it as the video goes on. And by people who haven't seen Fooly Cooly, I mean the people who, who wanted to skip past that spoiler warning. The story is set in the quiet town of Mabase, and follows a 12-year-old boy named Naota, who gets clocked in the head with a Rickenbacker 4001 guitar by a pink-haired girl on a yellow Vespa named Haruhara Haruko, who then proceeds to sneak into his life as an in-house maid, where Naota lives with his trashy father and porn-addicted grandfather, while his older brother Tosuku is playing baseball in America, leaving Naota to hang out with his 17-year-old girlfriend Mamimi, Tosuku's girlfriend. Naota then discovers the injury Haruko gave him created what is known as an NO portal, in which giant robots produced by a company named Medical Mechanica would pop out from time to time. Haruko hits one of the first robots to come out of Naota, which turns it into a friendly service robot named Conti. Haruko then claims the Naota to be a first-class space patrol officer, but it's later revealed that she's actually a temptress who went to Earth to search for an energy being with the ability to manipulate space, known as Atomisk, with the goal to devour him so she can use his powers. Over the course of the series, Adamus is gradually brought down to Earth and is later taken into custody by Medical Mechanica. Shortly thereafter, their factory, which has been seen throughout the entire series as a giant iron towering over the city, turns into a doomsday device that attempts to absorb Naota and Conti. Naota then becomes Adamus' host and ends up fighting Haruko in a short battle before Naota is able to force Adamus out of his body and release him into space, and the series ends with Haruko leaving Earth after him. Oh, that was quicker than I thought. Well, now that's out of the way, let's get into everything else. My name is Payne, and this is Fooly Cooly. Fooly Cooly was the brainchild of one Kazuya Sudamaki. He started his career in 1986, working as a key animator for six episodes of the science fiction anime Galaxy High School for TMS Entertainment, and would work mainly as an animator until he started working with Studio Gainax in 1991 as the animation director for a couple of episodes in the 39-episode comedy sci-fi series Nadia the Secret of Blue Water, a series directed by one of Gainax's co-founders, a man by the name of Hideaki Anno. The reason I mention this is because four years later, Anno would appoint him as an assistant director in 1995 to one of the most influential anime series of all time, Neon Genesis Evangelion, including a writing credit on the infamous final episode. He would go up the ranks just a couple years later as a co-director to Anno in both Evangelion Death and Rebirth and End of Evangelion. He would get his first directing stint in 1999 as an episode director for eight episodes on another series fully directed by Anno, Kane Kano, or His and Her Circumstances, before creating and making his lone directorial debut in Fully Cooly. Switching places with Anno here as he went back to his early days working on the key animation for the majority of the episodes. Today, Sudamaki has been the director for the Rebuild of Evangelion film series, with Anno supervising everything, and is currently directing the fourth and final film, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0, Thrice Upon a Time. Looking at what he's known for, it seems like he rarely gets the chance to create whatever he wanted, and instead is known for being under a shadow of someone else. In this case, it's Anno. And it came to no surprise that Sudamaki decided to take full advantage, and then some, of the only chance he got as most of the things he wanted to put in the series were exactly that. Things he just wanted to put in, just for the hell of it. 
and with that came a fuck ton of examples I happen to find that support this. The reason why robots are coming out of Nalitza's head was to represent how much Tsunamaki was thinking about and intensely working on the show, and if you want another visual representation of that, take a look at the giant hand monument in the middle of Mabase, because that is a photographic render of Tsunamaki's actual hand. The yellow Vespa that's seen in the live action sequence during the ending is also Tsunamaki's as well. He intentionally threw in obscure in-jokes and references with the goal to give Fully Cooly a wacky feel compared to Ava, one example being a scene where Haruko and Naota's dad are trying to put an egg yolk into each other's mouths without it breaking. That itself an homage to the 1985 Japanese comedy film Tampopo, which had a scene that did the exact same thing. Yes, I did actually watch that fucking movie to get the reference. He added certain symbols in every episode that relate to what has happened behind the scenes of certain Gainax shows, the best example being the numerous Ava references in episode 2. He got the title Fully Cooly from a CD in a music magazine with the same title, and it got its abbreviation FLCL just because he likes shortened titles. There originally wasn't going to be a robot, but Tsunamaki wanted one in there anyway, but didn't want it to look like a mech, so instead he put a TV on its head. The South Park sequence was only made because Studio Gainax was watching the show at the time they were making the episode. The reason why there's a cigarette that says Never Knows Best is because Tsunamaki saw it on a postcard once. Atomisk is based on a novel Tsunamaki read of the same title about the Cold War, which is also somewhat related to the USSR jacket worn by the character Minamori, more on her later in this video. He made Naoto's brother and Haruko left-handed because he saw left-handedness as pretty cool and had Haruko eat spicy food and Naoto not handle it because he had an admiration for people who could withstand it. The first manga sequence in episode 1 messed up the studio's computers so badly, multiple staff members had said that was the hardest thing they'd ever worked on and asked him not to do it again. The reason why Naoto uses a Gibson Flying V guitar later in the series is that he wanted to use the coolest one he could find visually so he can use it as a symbol for masculinity. The reason why the tone is all over the place from episode to episode was that Tsunamaki basically left his episode directors to do whatever the hell they wanted, and trust me, there's more to go through. There are a lot of examples, but I have to keep going with this video. The point is, Tsunamaki and his staff at Gainax basically did whatever they wanted to, which is partly the reason why this show is so unique compared to anything else in the medium, which reminds me of one more edition that is so big, I gave it its own section. The Pillows were officially formed on September 16th, 1989. At its founding, it was made up of vocalist Sawako Yamanaka, bassist Kenji Ueda, guitarist Yoshiaki Manabe, and drummer Shinichi Osato. From what I could find, while other rock bands from Japan around that time were taking the sound from whatever was coming out of Seattle, they started off their careers being inspired from groups like Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Marley, The Clash, and The Beatles, which was the main inspiration for their sound of their debut album Moon Gold in 1991 and from there built a reputation for their excessive touring schedule, which they still have to this very day, they still tour. They kinda grew out of it on their next record, Wide Incarnation, in 1992, the Beatles sound, and shortly after that, Ueda left the band due to creative differences. In 1994, the Pillows got picked up by King Records and released their first album as a trio, Cool Spice. The first album that I listened to where they were getting closer to forming their own identity and getting closer to that rock sound that we know them for in Fully Cooley. Things started to really go up for them in 1996 after releasing their breakthrough single Strange Chameleon, which grew their fan base, became a cult favorite for any diehard Pillows fan, and was the first Pillow song I heard that sounded like it would have been on the Fully Cooley soundtrack, which makes it fitting that it would be on their breakthrough album in 1997, Please Mr. Lost Man, a record that has grown on me since I first heard it for this video. Seriously, if you like their Fooly Cooly stuff, you will love this album. Now, this is the time period where the Pillows would get Kazuya Tsunamaki's attention, starting when they released the alt-rock ballad One Life as a single in late 1997, a song that would, no joke intended, eventually plant the idea into Tsunamaki's head that these guys might be the perfect band to make music for the show instead of using any orchestral or piano tracks, just like what he did with uh, Hideaki Anno at the end of Evangelion, which just came out. The next three albums The Pillows would release, Little Busters in 1998 and both Runner's High and Happy Bivouac, I think I'm saying that right, in 1999, would play a crucial part mainly because several tracks from each album were hand-picked and put into the Fully Cooly soundtrack. This included tracks alongside One Life like 
Little Busters, Last Dinosaur, Sad Sad Kitty, Brand New Love Song, Carnival, Crazy Sunshine, the list goes on. There's a lot of songs. But there were also a couple of tracks that Pillows released which were made specifically for the show. The first one is I Think I Can, which has grown on me quite a lot after listening to it outside of the show. But while brainstorming the second track, Sawako Yamanaka and Tsunamaki weren't on the same page at first. According to Yamanaka, Tsunamaki wanted a song that was similar to One Life, but he had no idea what he meant by that because the band never made any music for an anime series before. So in an act of rebellion, they gave him a song that was entirely different from what Tsunamaki asked for, but I guess the song grew on him because he would later make it the ending theme for Fooly Cooly. Yes, I'm talking about... <laughs> And it wouldn't be long before Right on Shooting Star become the show's main theme, the defining song for the pillows outside of Japan, and the first thing people would mention if you ever tell them about Fooly Cooly. They would release those two tracks on their first greatest hits album in 2001, Fool on the Planet, and have been playing them in concerts ever since. Since the show was released, they've been still going strong in Japan, where they made 14 more studio albums before getting picked up to make the music for the two sequel series, Fooly Cooly Progressive and Fooly Cooly Alternative. Two series I have yet to see, but have not heard good things about, and as of right now, I'm only familiar with the music that was used, because I've listened to the Pillows music on there multiple times. The best way to compare the pillows from 1997 onwards is like a mix of Radiohead, Green Day, a little bit of Matchbox 20, uh, Good Weezer, like pre-Pinkerton Weezer, uh, Oasis, and the Pixies, which for the last one is pretty fitting because their 1999 record, Happy Bivouac, is literally a tribute album to the Pixies. One of the tracks is even named after one of the band members. Point is, there's a number of reasons why this band is great. They still sound great after 30 years of making music, it'll fit perfectly in any playlist with other great 90s rock songs, and in the realm of Fooly Cooly, makes for some unforgettable scenes thanks in part not only to the music, but to the sound design too, as it was the base for certain tones and moments throughout all six episodes. It's mixed in a way where it comes off as honest, and it works to its advantage because it adds to the show's authenticity. Now that we got the process behind the making of Fooly Cooly out of the way, Let's take a look at what followed since the show's release in Japan. In June of 2003, Production IG sold the broadcasting rights to Cartoon Network and would start premiering it on their late night programming block Adult Swim on August 4th. This is where the majority of you who have seen this show probably first watched it. I can't say that's where I first saw it, but nevertheless, the lasting effect the show has had on people is massive. I mean, can you really think of another anime series where both the show itself and the band playing its music have separate, dedicated fan bases that would eventually join forces? Anyway, even though the broadcast rights were sold for the next decade and a half, the intellectual property itself stayed with Studio Gainax, even as the studio was going down financially. That was until they sold the IP to Production IG, who in turn gave it to Adult Swim, who played a big part in the production of the sequels. But that wasn't the whole story. According to a very long expose Hideaki Anno wrote late last year about his time with Gainax and their terrible decisions financially over the years, he wanted to buy the IP from Fooly Cooly from Gainax so that Kazuya Tsunamaki could continue working on it at Anno's new studio, Studio Kara, in 2014. One thing led to another, and the discussion was postponed to months later, where Anna would be absolutely blindsided when he found out the price for the IP is now six times higher than what it previously was. This made it hard for him to negotiate with them, and initially another meeting was planned, but in 2015, Gainax gave the IP to IG. Behind Anno's back, basically, they did it without consulting him, which led to IG giving the IP in turn to Adult Swim, which led to the creation of the sequels, which, again, I really don't see a reason to review it. The voice acting was another huge aspect Sudamaki had a part in arranging as he worked on both the Japanese and the English dubs. In the Japanese dub, he had a personal preference in picking who was going to be in Fully Cooly. He believed, instead of picking voice actors that were more experienced, he picked the ones that he believed caught the essence of the character and helped bring it come to life. The biggest example of that was of Mayumi Shintani, who played Haruko and who only had a couple of roles under her belt at that time. 
but it was her debut appearance on another Gainax series on his and her circumstances back in 1999 that caught Tsudamaki's attention due to how unconventional her voice sounded in a role like that in that type of show. From there, not only did he give her the part, but her performance was also the catalyst for Haruko's character design, as Shintani's unique voice helped influence the creation of a unique character. The right to make the English dub was acquired by a now-defunct studio called SyncPoint, which was a part of the Japanese media company Broccoli in March of 2001 and was manned by Mark Handler, a man considered to be the pioneer of anime distribution to the West. He first became a writer at Disney before writing the English translations for numerous anime shows and movies like the original Voltron series and the Cowboy Bebop series and movie before he started working on the translations for Fully Cooley in August of 2001. This was also around the time Handler and the staff at SyncPoint started communications with Studio Gainax, a process Handler became familiar with after working on the dub for Cowboy Bebop as he constantly communicated with Studio Sunrise. After Handler completed the script in September, then came the process of picking who to voice the characters, which also had a couple of voice actors who had little experience beforehand, but in the years after the dub's release would solidify themselves as big names in the dubbing industry. Playing Mamimi was a woman named Jennifer Sekiguchi, later revealed to be the pseudonym for Stephanie Shea, who only had a couple of voice acting roles at the time, and playing Hadako was Carrie Walgren, someone with no voice acting experience before this, and only had a handful of radio and theater roles under her belt before voice acting for Fully Cooley. After the voiceover was set to begin in October, Tsunamaki stopped by the studio for the first few days to overlook the dubbing process and the people involved with it before going back to Japan and switching with production IG representative Maki Terashima Furuda, who helped out Handler and the staff for the entire process until the dubbing was completed in late November, and her input as well as the communication with Studio Gainax was key in making the dub as authentic as they possibly can, especially when it comes to the numerous instances of really obscure in-jokes and wordplay, which, according to a number of the members, some of the original jokes had to stay, while others had to be replaced with more American alternatives, which even made the staff acknowledge just how challenging and complex Fooly Cooly was, which, according to Handler, was what made working on the show really fun in the first place, and it also made an impression on both Shay and Walgren, who decided after that to keep working in the dubbing industry. This drive for authenticity, the subject matter they were given, and the consistent approval from Studio Gainax on certain things is one of the big reasons why Fooly Cooly has what is considered to be one of the best dubs of an anime series ever. Now, for my personal thoughts on it all, and what I think it all means. In addition to the main storyline I mentioned earlier, there are also a few characters with storylines of their own that deserve to be mentioned, as well as what part I believe they play in the series. The first one is Mamimi, also known as, for people who watched the show as a kid, your first crush. Don't lie to yourself. Her story begins in elementary school, when, after getting constantly bullied, she decided to burn the school down with her in it. But, at the last second, Naota's older brother Tosuku saves her, making him now her boyfriend in her mind, while in the general sphere, they just became really good friends. But, because she kept thinking this way for so long, her reaction to his departure to America to play baseball isn't good, as she now hangs out with Naota and treats him more as a placeholder for his older brother, as she often goes near him to keep her stress levels down, or as she says it, to keep her from overflowing. Even though Naota and Mamimi are five years apart, they are exact polar opposites of each other. While Naota is a kid who wants to be mature and more independent, Mamimi is a teenager who doesn't want to accept that she's in a position where she has to be mature and more independent instead of having this fever dream that her one true love would come back and help her out with everything. Without really giving much thought, Haruhara Haruko is an adult who doesn't want to grow up and doesn't give a shit what society thinks of her, but while she comes off that way to most of the people in the show, her true intentions co-align with what her main goal is, the goal being to take Adamus' power for herself. But in this context, Adamus represents a more nubile version of herself that she wants to be which is the reason why she wants his powers, but because she wants to keep this rebellious attitude wherever she goes at the same time, this puts her in an endless cycle where she is always trying to go after what she needs, but in every instance that she experiences Adamus, 
The only person keeping her from obtaining what she really wants is herself. Finally, there is the character that I've only mentioned once in this video, and that's Eri Ninamori, the daughter of the city's mayor, the class president, and Naota's quote-unquote crush. She goes through the same issues, but unlike Naota, it's quickly resolved after a couple of episodes, and instead of literally facing these issues, she faces them internally. We first see her in the middle of a media frenzy as her parents are going through a divorce, establishing her motives for wanting to act like an adult, but here is where it's different. Add on the fact she constantly has a spotlight on her because she's the mayor's daughter and the class president, and you have a lot of pressure that she's putting on herself. And the only way she could even handle this pressure was to hide who she really is. In turn, her way of not admitting the people she has a juvenile bone in her body and believes if she plays this facade long enough, she'll turn into it, thinking she'll never have to worry or show her weaknesses in the public eye ever again. A plan that's impossible to achieve, but she assumes it's the only way to come off as sophisticated. This is where she meets Naota, the first person who she trusts in showing her true self. An action portrayed by the fact she shows him wearing glasses while out in public, she has contacts on. Over the course of her arc, she gets over her fear and would make an inherent compromise with herself, where she would show certain things to certain people, just so she wouldn't think she's hiding her true self from the world. The most famous instance of this comes when the curtains rise on her at the school play. She's seen wearing glasses in public, something she wouldn't have thought of doing until she indicates there are no lenses in them, and would say, They're fake. I know I'm going after this from a different perspective. I don't know how many other people talking about Fully Cooley have admitted this, but I never saw this show when it came out in 2003, which makes a lot of sense when you add in the fact that as of the release of this video, I'm not even old enough to drink yet. But that doesn't mean I never got the same reactions as someone who watched it back then would. It just so happens I've heard a lot about the show beforehand. So here's what I think of the show as a whole. Contrary to the belief that many YouTubers have stated that the show makes no sense because there's so much going on in all six episodes, to that I say that's true and not true. It really does depend on how you want to watch it how you want to consume the product. Because I can tell you two separate instances where I watched the entire thing both with my brain off and my brain on, and in both times I was entertained. That's something unfortunately I haven't seen many people talk about or say. It's almost like it's two sides of the same coin. You can't pick both when really that's not the case, although I can kind of understand why people do. You either want to come off as mainstream by saying that you watched it with your brain off and it's just mindless fun, or you want to come off as smart by saying that it means a certain thing. Watching something that forces you to turn your brain off is as important as watching something that has meaning. For multiple reasons, this is an extremely important anime, and one that, for me, is surprisingly easily suggestible. It's perfect for kids because of the violence, and it's perfect for adults because it gives them something to look back on and relate and know there was a show that knew exactly how a 12-year-old would think. And when you're my age, you start to not see it only from Naota. There's a piece of all four I can relate to because I've thought like them at one point, and in some cases, I still do. I thought like Naota when I thought all of the adults around me were acting pretty childish. I thought like Haruko when I didn't want to act like an adult at all. I thought like Mamimi during a time where I knew I needed to be an adult, I just didn't want to, and I thought like Nina Mori when I was too shy of showing people who I really was or what I was working on or doing. It's thoughts like these that come naturally and are a part of growing up, which again is what makes Fully Cooley stand the test of time after 20 years of sex, maturity, and rock and roll. It stands as a reminder that when you step up to the plate, when a big opportunity comes your way, just remember that nothing will happen unless you swing the bat.